Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 327 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring fraternity and sorority leaders together. Fun fact, I was speaking to the students over the last couple of weeks about sexual assault prevention on their campuses. And the common theme that was mentioned in conversations was that some of the conversations that were had weren't productive in the past when the person speaking didn't have any experience within the fraternity and sorority community to understand the culture that exists there and how we can change it by working together. I do think that we can leverage the values of our fraternity or sorority to further this discussion on things like consent and bystander intervention. But if you don't understand the values of these organizations, <laughs> then it can be really hard to get there for the students. Now, speaking of which, I think we have a fantastic guest on the show today. Tracy Rector is a speaker and award-winning win film producer and author and a survivor who uses her voice to raise awareness of gender-based violence. USA Today recognized her film, No Ordinary Love, as one of the biggest summer movies in 2021. She's spoken at events in the U.S., including Guam, Asia Pacific, and also the U.K. Tracy served as board chair of the second largest domestic violence agency in the state of Texas. Her passion and energy are ever-present on stage. After the film's release, she also launched Project Raise Awareness to screen this film at colleges across the country as a Title IX event. Welcome to the show, Tracy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you today. Oh, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for raising awareness on gender-based violence, your film. I have so much to talk to you about. I think this is absolutely incredible work that you're doing. But I think for our audience, it's always great to talk about the past, to understand where you came from. You decided on Texas Tech University for your undergraduate experience. Tell our audience, what made you decide that Texas Tech was the right place for you? Well, everybody knows who Texas Tech is now because of Patrick Mahomes. So right. <laughs> I don't really have to say a lot about tech to explain where that is or what it is. But I was actually born in Lubbock and my family, my dad was transferred with his job to Fort Worth but right before I started first grade. So it was like I was going back to my educational roots there. It, West Texas is a special place. The people that are there are so friendly and so kind. So when I went to visit the campus, it was just a welcoming atmosphere and it, it just it made sense for me. So I don't think the college search process was intense back then in the old days when I was doing it <laughs> as it is now. So it just made sense and I, I loved it. And then my two younger brothers followed me out there. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I mean, I have a couple of kids that are trying to figure out what college they want to go to. And this is like a national search. This is like a process that I've never seen anything like it. I feel like I made a decision on a whim and my kids are over prepared, been to every campus, spent like time talking to professors and students and the whole thing. It's just, uh, it's really amazing how things have evolved over time. But you're absolutely right. When Patrick Mahomes uh, is the quarterback there, it's real easy to know where Lubbock, Texas is right now. And uh, good yes. luck to him uh, the rest of the way. We hope to see him uh, in the Super Bowl. What can I say? Absolutely. <laughs> We're cheering him on from the, all the tech fans for sure. Of course. Of course. Now, you also joined Tri-Delta Sorority at Texas Tech. Tell us what was special about these women that made you want to join them? Well, I grew up in a very Greek family. Mm parents, aunts and uncles, cousins, a lot of people were fraternities or sororities. So it was just like, it was something that was just going to happen when I went to college and I was very excited about it. And I know that sorority life offers so much incoming students, especially if you're coming from a small high school to a large university. It's really nice to have a place to land and have a place to help guide you through that whole process. And I honestly, I had a hard time deciding when I was at Tech because I I loved a lot of the different sororities, but for me, something was a little bit different about Tridel. They just seemed to really like each other and support each other. And it just, it was a happy place for me. And it just felt like a really good fit. Um, I was a Delta Gamma legacy. So I didn't 
I didn't pledge Delta Gamma, <laughs> but my daughter came through for me when she went to TCU. She pledged Delta Gamma, so it got me out of the hot box. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we want our kids and we want you to find your home wherever that is at Texas Tech or any campus that you might be on. And sometimes uh, it's a perfect fit. Other times you're like, ah, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and so ultimately you found your home, your daughter, your daughter ended up being a Delta Gamma. So, hey, listen, eventually you made it there. It just skipped a generation. That's all. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah. that's great. I'm so happy that you had a good experience. I think that is fantastic. Let's talk about your film, because when USA Today comes out and recognizes your film that you made on intimate partner violence, it's called No Ordinary Love, as one of the biggest summer movies in 2021, that's a huge honor. I mean, that that really speaks volumes, I think, in terms of the work that you're doing. What made you want to produce this film in the first place? Well, first, we were so excited when USA Today came out and said that we made this film right before COVID started. And so when we were in the film festival and all the marketing phase of it, it was right in the throes of COVID. And you know what that did to the movie industry. So yeah. it was really hard to get noticed during that time period. So that was really a big deal for us. Um, but honestly, it was a risk for me to just to jump into being a filmmaker. I've, I've not had any experience and it and didn't even have a dream or intend to do this. But as you mentioned, I was on the board for the second largest domestic violence agency in my area in North Texas or in Fort Worth and Arlington, Texas area. And when I was on the board, I became board chair and I got um, privy to information from a fatality review that they do every year and it said that most of the women that died in our area had not gone to the shelter they haven't even called the hotline and i was stunned that if we aren't if all the work we're doing we're not helping those they're in the greatest need they don't know the services are available to them or they don't know that they're in that grave of danger what are we doing we need to do more and i just knew as a survivor of domestic violence i really felt compelled to do something to raise awareness and I didn't start with the film as the first idea. I had lots of other ideas for promoting it locally, but it really, it dawned on me that this is a global issue and I really wanted to do something global and there's no better way to convey or, or shine a light on a social issue than with film. It can definitely go global. So that, I was excited about that. I did know a young filmmaker and I reached out to her and asked her if she would uh, jump on this adventure with me. And she said, absolutely. So we, we, she knew more about it than I did. She didn't know much about domestic violence. So I hooked her up with our agency. She learned a whole lot, did lots of research. She interviewed 20 women living in the shelter, went to a domestic violence homicide trial. She attended offender classes, a lot of research. I wanted, I asked her two things. I wanted it to be very authentic. I didn't want a Hollywood version of domestic violence. And also, just so people know, this is a full feature film. It is not a documentary. Not many people want to watch a documentary on domestic violence. It'd be very informative, but it's not very entertaining. And I wanted to reach anybody and everybody. So that's what my goal was. That So it had to be authentic. And I also wanted to shine light on spiritual abuse because that's a big part of my own experience. So we just jumped into it. We filmed it. Um, then we went did the film festival circuit. And then we finally did get pick up for distribution and, and it was released in the summer of 2021. Wow. That's amazing. That's very brave of you to just go out there and say, hey, I got this idea and I'm going to produce a full feature film. I mean, that's huge. I mean, I, I haven't certainly I've never done it. I don't even know where I would begin. So it's great that you had, I guess, you know, some people along with you on the ride that kind of knew what to do to guide you in that process, because it's I wouldn't even know where to begin. Curve. Yeah, it's a huge learning curve. <laughs> just, and we, it's funny because I people ask about the whole filming process sometimes. And I, I say, you know, when we're in the middle of whatever phase we're in, I always felt like that was the hardest. Like pre-filming was so hard. You have to find all these locations and get all these permits and find the actors and all this. And that was hard. And then we started filming and 12, 14 hour days. That was hard. And even though I was executive producer, I had many, many other roles from helping with wardrobe to locations, set locations. And I was in charge of craft service. If you know anything about filming, that's all the food, all the food. So it, there was, it was quite a process. And then doing the film festivals was hard and the distribution process. So it was a challenge, but it was um, as a challenge I was up for. 
Wow. Good for you. That's awesome. I think that's incredible. So talk to us, what was like some of the reactions from the people who saw the film and did their reaction surprise you in any way? I think the most surprising reaction was when people go, wow, this is a real film. <laughs> it's, it's usually <laughs> yes. like friends and family members who I guess they just didn't think I could pull it off or something. I don't know. But my my friend who's the director and writer, she and I laugh every time someone says that. But we had a lot of positive feedback as well. Um, when we first showed the film, it was like our premiere and locally that we showed it just to cast and crew and family and friends. The director had a woman walk up to her afterwards and say, wow, that was so impactful. She said, I left my abusive husband four months ago and I was really considering going back to him because finances were really hard. I was struggling a little bit. She goes, but seeing the film, I know I can't do that. And she said, thank you for sharing the information because we did a talk back afterwards and she reached out to the DV agency to get some help so she could could make it without going back to him. Because it, it's a huge issue. A lot of women, it, they say it takes up to seven times for them to, to leave for the final time because there's so much of a, a draw for them to go back. Finances is a huge part of that. We also heard from a lot of the national experts on domestic violence that I'd reach out to either on social media or some other way, ask them to watch the film. And they all raved about it, how authentic it was. It was very realistic to what it what it really looks like, which was some, was surprising to them because most of the time it's something like the burning bed or sleeping with the enemy. It's the extreme example. We wanted to show things, some of that, but a lot of what it is is coercive control. And that's a hard thing to convey when you're trying to tell someone about it, but you can illustrate it through a story very well. And that's what we, we've done with this. So, but we also loved hearing from film critics who said it's a romantic thrill that keeps you on the edge of your seat. So we like that it's the combination of that. But I would have to say that the greatest accolades that we got, even above the awards we received at film festivals, was when we heard back from survivors who said that it was very realistic, very triggering for a lot of them. And when, if we show up publicly, we always give that trigger warning. Uh, but they said it was very realistic that they saw signs of their abuser on the screen. They saw signs of themselves on the screen and that it was reassuring to them that it was real, that it really was abuse because a lot of us survivors question whether it's abuse. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the greatest compliment is that we really accomplished what I set out to accomplish, a realistic, authentic, good story. Yeah. And you're reaching the masses, just like you said. It's not a documentary, but it's something that everybody can sink their teeth into and learn something new along the way. Um, and I think you're shining a light on a really important part of society that not a lot of people talk about publicly. Um, so I really like that. And, you know, I'm wondering, what are the college students think when they watch this movie? What kind of reactions are you getting from them? What are some of the questions that you get from students during that Q&A period after the film? I absolutely love screening this to college students. The 16 to 24 year olds are in the highest risk age group for being in an abusive relationship, yet most of them don't realize that their relationship is abusive. So it's, it's really interesting the reactions we get from college students. I have to tell you a funny story. We did, <clears throat> we had, had a whole lot of them campus events booked during October of a year ago when Delta showed up in August and shut the campuses down again. So those all went away. So we rescheduled them for the next February and then Omicron showed up in December and shut all those down. But I had one school, TCU in Fort Worth, and she had some money, some NCAA money that she had to use. It was earmarked for this kind of an event. And so we pivoted and we did, we made it into a virtual event. We couldn't show the whole film because we can't protect it, protect it if we do it online, but we show film clips and then we talk about it and then we do film clips. So at TCU, they had this, she, she pointed out to me that at that time, half of their student body had only experienced college through COVID. All their freshman class, all their sophomore class. And so they weren't used to going to in-person events. So everything was done online. And so they had set up this point system. So you got, you had to get so many points, especially the fraternities and sororities showed up for that mm -hmm. to encourage them to have more of a normal campus experience. So they had to acquire so many points. So some of them were coming to this event to get the points. We realized that, right? <laughs> so when we first started, we, we introduced it, we show the film clip and we start talking about it. There are a little bit of questions, a little bit of chatter, but not a lot. But by the second film clip, we just got 
inundated with questions and the director and I laughed. We said, you know, half of the group that were listening, they were in their kitchen getting a cup of coffee or they were reading, reading an assignment. All of a sudden, something we said piqued their interest and they were all in. And by, by the middle of it, we had 950 students on that phone call. Mm -hmm. And the questions kept coming and we went 30 minutes over because the questions kept coming and they were so grateful to have the conversation. We talked about digital abuse and they asked all kinds of questions like, what do you mean digital abuse? And so I'll give examples like, well, you know what an Apple AirTag is, right? You maybe got one for your dad because he can't ever find his key car keys. And I said, but it can be used in an abusive situation. So if your boyfriend is controlling and wants to have power over your life, he could hide one in your backpack or in your purse or in your car. So he knows where you are all the time. And they're like, whoa, what are you talking about? And the, and the other things about how you know, the digital abuse with your passwords and your, your usernames to get on something. And I said, you know, you may think of it as um, your a mean boyfriend coming up and go, give me your phone and tell me what your passwords are. No, it's very subtle. It happens like this. He says, my phone's dead. I need to check the scores of the game. Can I borrow your phone? What's your password? Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to check the scores. It's very subtle. So that's, so it opened their eyes to look at things very differently, but more in a realistic point of view. So we get a lot of those questions. I always try to turn the conversation <clears throat> back the other way too. It's important to know what the red flags of abuse are, but it's also really important to know what constitutes a healthy relationship. If this is what I'm not supposed to look for, then what am I supposed to be looking for? Mm -hmm. And then I also put it back in each of their laps. I said, These, this is what a healthy relationship looks like. This is what a healthy partner looks like. So look at yourself. How are you contributing to the relationship? Are you putting out red flags or green flags? So it really gives them some of that introspection to think about their role in their own intimate relationships. And hopefully they take all this information and, and take it to heart and use that to really end up having a healthy relationship for the rest of their life. That's great work that you're doing. And I love that the students were so engaged, even online, seeing those little clips. I think that's fantastic. And you're right. I mean, sometimes students, there is incentive for fraternities and sororities to show up to some of these meetings in terms of getting points or, or what have you. Um, and I get that stuff all the time online, too, where students are like, yeah, the only reason why the room is packed there is because they're forced to go to that presentation. And that might be so, but then they have the time of their lives because I actually do surveys at the end from all the students on their phones in real time so i'm able to capture what they thought of the presentation both in a quantitative sense and a qualitative sense because they actually start leaving written testimonials as well as their ratings and so we collect all of this data and i'm like yeah maybe they were forced quote unquote to be there for points but the truth is they had the time of their lives and they learned something so that's right yeah you know, that's so you great can say whatever you want but you know at the end of the day the students loved it so you know so who cares how they got there the the real point is did they enjoy themselves and did they learn something <laughs> Exactly. Well, that's why I started the program, because I knew that this was an issue with this age group. And it's a lot easier for a college campus event coordinator to invite students to come watch a movie as it is to come listen to a lecture. And so if if you weren't doing the, the virtual one and you weren't forcing them to come to it, coming to a movie has a lot more appeal. And so they can fill up their auditorium a lot easier with that kind of a, a situation. Then we just open it up for Q&A. We also always end a Q&A with uh, giving the resources. We help them understand where they go locally on their campus, but also in their community. And we give them the national domestic violence hotline number we want to make sure that they all have that because that's important for them to have in their phone if they have a cousin or a friend that's going somewhere out of state they want to make sure they have that number that they can help somebody when they reach out to them about their abusive relationship mm -hmm. that's great that you're sharing all the resources i think that's <laughs> super important what else can we do to prevent intimate partner violence from happening in the future well, that's the million dollar question yeah. in the world that I live in. You know, honestly, we have a lot of science and research. We're able to predict and prevent a lot of these very violent, abusive situations. And a lot of communities are doing things like a coordinated community response, where they have lots of the community partners that come together to try to solve this problem. The biggest obstacle is funding. 
and being on the radar. When we have to take two to three years to reenact the, Vol the Violence Against Women Act, that's craziness. That holds up funding and it holds up a very important um, work that can be done, services that can be provided. I think one of the most important things that we can do is prevention. I wish that every school classroom from kindergarten through 12th grade had some kind of programming that helped them understand what this issue is. So when, for example, in second, third, and fourth grade, it looks like bullying. It doesn't look like an abusive relationship, right? They're not dating yet. So mm -hmm. you talk about that, about from both perspectives, from being a victim to being an abuser. The bully is the one that's being the abuser, but the victim, that person needs to be empowered to stand up for themselves. And also that real important bystander piece in bullying as well as in dating violence. So we have prevention education to help them understand what that is and that it's okay to stand up for yourself and that no one should ever take your agency away from you or have power and control over you, whether that's in a fourth grade a bullying situation or in a junior or senior in high school dating situation. And I think if you talk about it, it's really important to raise that awareness. I think if everybody knew what it was like to truly be in an abusive relationship and understand the complexities of it from the very beginning of it to when someone's really deeply involved in it and having a difficult time leaving that would really go a far a far away of, of helping us deal with it but the the funding is a, a really important piece of it we don't have enough money to pay for these prevention programs Mm -hmm. And we really do need that. And that's what my movie is all about. It's a it's about a prevention education. It's a little bit late to the game being in college, but it's it's when a lot of young adults are dating to either maybe not find that one person, but no, to, but to try it out and see what that's like and know. And when you date, you find out what you do like and what you don't like, maybe what you're more looking for for a long term relationship. So it's important for them to know those red flags and green flags that I talked about earlier at that particular time. I would completely agree with you. I think we need to have more funding. We need to be doing more prevention work. I think every six months on a college campus to be talking about consent, to be talking about bystander intervention. But I mean, the funding is really a question of priorities for the Absolutely. institution, all right? Exactly I mean, you, you spend money on what's a priority for you. I mean, and you can just look, I mean, I, I hate to, to call out the elephant in the room, but a lot of colleges and universities spend a lot of money on athletics. I mean, let's just, let's just call it what it is, right? And so it's a matter of priorities. What's most important to you? I, I think that is the question. That really is kind of what we have to be asking. <laughs> um, now, it, it you know, really, go ahead. No, it really, that is a very important question to ask. Yeah. And it's it's not lost on me that a lot of the schools that have funding to pay for my program have money because of the NCAA fines that they've received because they haven't dealt with this issue adequately. Right. So it would be an investment on their part to put money into these programs to prevent those things from happening. I would love to go and speak to an athletic group football players, basketball, all athletics, men and women with this with this program and with this issue to really help them understand this is important for you to get this now, to understand what it's like to be in a relationship. If you want to have a happy relationship for the rest of your life, this is really important to know now and that what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Because if you if if someone commits a felony by assaulting someone in a relationship, that's going to affect your life as more in that regard and in, in, with it, the law enforcement end of it, <clears throat> excuse me, than it is for the the victim. Mm -hmm. She deals from, from a psychological pro perspective, but he may end up having a record. And so it's important for them to understand that if you feel like you have an issue and you're not dealing with this properly, you can get some help with that to learn yeah. how to better with I'm with you. We have the same frustrations. I'd rather spend the time on the prevention side than coming in after there's already an issue. And now we have a survivor on a campus. We have somebody who has a criminal record and all of these things. Uh, I'd much rather do the prevention work. I mean, a hundred times, give me the prevention stuff rather than after something terrible has happened on campus. And, you know, I start to think about the Title IX offices because I do speak to college students around the country on this particular particular topic. And I think from the student perspective, there's just a lot of frustration around some of the Title IX offices in terms of the transparency that they have in the 
the procedures, um, in terms of accountability for the students. So what do you say about that? I mean, what can we be doing differently from the Title IX office perspective to maybe increase transparency or increase accountability when there are all of these policies in place to protect the identity of students, for example? Yes, I, it's a very good question. It is a complicated process right now, and I think it's new enough. I know it's been around for 20 or so years, but it's new enough that I think a lot of universities are still trying to figure out the best way to do it. And unfortunately, a lot of times it seems like trial and error. So they try it one way until it, it blows up in their face and then they regroup and try to do it a different way. But it's, it's hard. You, you're trying to protect both parties, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's very difficult situation for them to be in and it's not a court of law so they have to do it uh, navigate that very carefully I think one of the best things they could do is to have my film come to their campus and, <laughs> and educate everybody about it it's it's interesting that you bring up the title on office because I have reached out to several and I get very different reactions from uh, various Title IX offices. Some are very eager to talk to me and some are very much not eager to talk to me. And I get the feeling that some Title IX offices are not really into the education part of it and prevention part of it. They're into the reactionary part of it. Mm -hmm. So that's their main concern is to react when something has already happened instead of preemptively, like you talked about doing something before to keep it from being a problem. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Title IX coordinator really walks a tightrope because they're on the one side, they have the students that they're trying to protect both victim and abuser. But on the other side, they have the university that they also have to protect their name and their reputation and they're answerable to the administration. So they're trying to do both of these things at the same time, which sometimes can be mutually exclusive from each other. So I think it's very tricky. I don't, um, I don't envy any of them, the position that they're in, but I do wish that all of them, regardless of what their situation is, that they would really put an emphasis on the prevention piece. I know there's funding for it, they will look for it and ask for it but i because of their reaction i've had to kind of go through other channels to get attention sometimes i go through um the women and gender studies or through psychology or through the nursing program and also through pol uh, campus police because they're the ones that deal with some of these in incidents so they have a vested interest in in doing this as well so i don't care who sponsors the film showing or the prevention programming as long as someone on campus is doing that yeah, sometimes we have to get creative. And I do think it does come back to funding sometimes because maybe there's just not enough people staffing the Title IX office in order to deal with all of these uh, claims and policies and all of the, the work that needs to be done. So it, that could be part of it. Uh, it's just not enough people in the office to do the work. Um, so maybe that's another reason why you're not getting the callbacks immediately because they're inundated. Uh, well, I also, one other thing I encountered is especially with the smaller colleges, there'll be a Title IX coordinator and they are taking care of two or three campuses. Oh my they're, they're working part time at each one, trying to cover all of that one person. So again, funding and the, they need more employees in these. If, if this is really going to be a priority, they right. need to put their money into that process so that they can do it adequately and do a good job. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask this question because you're a Tridelt, you get it, what it means to be a sorority woman. Do you believe that the fraternity and sorority community has an obligation to get more involved in this issue? I do. I do, actually. Um, I think on many campuses, a good number of student leaders are in the fraternities and the sororities. Mm -hmm. And so by making this a priority, they have the opportunity to truly change lives. I know that um, Panhellenic can sponsor an event like this, too, and oftentimes they're very interested in that. And I think the sororities and fraternities are a great place to start this conversation. They sponsor a lot of the social activities on campus as well. Uh, there's one sorority, the Alpha Chi Megas. This the domestic violence is their philanthropy. So that would be a really good place for a campus to start something, an event like this for them to be the ones that lead the way in that i'm not as familiar with the fraternities maybe they i don't know if they do philanthropies like the sororities do uh, that was not something we did when i was at texas tech but it's something new but i love that they do that they really get behind a cause and 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 try to bring some awareness to that social issue mm -hmm. so this the decision to who to be in an intimate relationship whether you marry or not it it creates 
a huge percentage of your happiness or your misery in your life. And it can be one of the most, if not the most important decision you ever make. So I think, well, I can attest to the misery part for sure, being in that position. But I think that the, the fraternities and sororities have a real important role and an obligation to really be the leaders on their campus and help make this issue be something that we talk about and stop hiding it and and stop uh, turning away it's an ugly issue so it's easy to to look the other way and not look at it and notice it it's not as easy to jump onto as maybe something like childhood cancer which is a horrible tragedy and it's and you want to help children it's an easier thing to, to jump onto than to, than domestic violence or dating violence but it's a really important issue that affects so many many people yeah. Well, to answer your question, absolutely. Fraternities do have national philanthropies and they are actually, I'm seeing, you know, as the years go by, they're getting more involved in this issue in sexual assault prevention on college campuses. So I think we're making progress. Uh, just the fact that we're able to talk about it publicly, uh, bring in people like you or some of the speakers at Greek University to talk about these issues. I think we're making progress. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done. By no means have we solved this. Let me be very clear. However, the fact that we're talking about it in fraternity and sorority on a regular basis, I think speaks volumes. And uh, I agree with you. I think we do have an obligation as values-based organizations to talk about this and to use peer-to-peer -peer education to help other students on campus understand how to solve this problem, whether it be through teaching consent or teaching bystander intervention. I think there's a role to play for every college student and why not have the fraternity and sorority community lead the way? So that way they yeah. are actually the solution to the problem as opposed to you are the problem. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Yes. Yeah. Well, very, very good. good. I think this is great. So tell us, I mean, you've already made a, a full feature film. What are your next steps in continuing this mission that you're on? Well, I I've hope to continue presenting on college campuses. The director and I are going to, as Texans, we are traveling to Fargo, North Dakota at the end of February. <laughs> <laughs> and the it. temperature terrifies me a little bit. We uh, really close to there is the University of Minnesota at Moorhead. So we're going to present there on their campus in person. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. We also have an event that's uh, happening in February at the University uh, Florida State is doing it with a couple of other um, another university there and some other programming there. So we are trying to make a difference. February is Dating Violence Awareness Month. So it's a great time to raise awareness with that. Um, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, which is also a really good time to, to bring this message into that because that also happens within intimate relationships. Honestly, I would love to produce a short film on just dating violence. So the No Ordinary Love, the movie that I made, has two married couples in it, and it's two women deal, lives, their lives intersect as they try to deal with their abusive relationship, abusive marriages. But I've had several requests for a short film specifically on dating violence so that they can use it within a, um, a classroom context as an educational tool and then talk about it. So an hour and a half feature film is too long. It's too difficult for them to navigate that. You can't really cut it down. So to start with a, um, a short film specifically on dating violence with, with characters that look that age and have the same issues. There, there are a lot of similarities in dating violence and domestic violence, but there's some nuances that are a little bit different. So I don't know if that'll happen or not. Again, we go back to the funding piece. <laughs> there, it takes a lot of money to to um, create a good film. And so we'll see. But that would be a hope for me to be able to do that. That's fantastic. I love your dreams. I love where you're going with this. I agree. A short film would be great. As you know, Gen Z, you know, <laughs> I love Gen Z because they are so focused. They are so driven. Uh, they're so competitive. I love all of those things, but their patience is like so short. And so, so that's the one issue I have with Gen Z and they know it. They know it. I mean, that's why TikTok has taken off with these 15 second videos is because their patience is short and they watch the video and they're on to the next thing. So I think where you're headed makes a lot of sense to me to have that short film. I think uh, that would really, really work with this particular generation. So uh, so kudos to you. I, I absolutely love it. Now, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And I know there are some great restaurants in Fort Worth, in Arlington, all these places where you're hanging out. So where should I go for some great food the next time I'm in town? 
<laughs> well, if you come to Fort Worth and it's your first time to come or second or third, you have to go to Joe T. Garcia's. It is probably the most well-known restaurant in town. It's Mexican food, old family from Fort Worth. They've been there forever. And it's known for the place where celebrities and even famous musicians who come for, to give a concert, they want to go or have their, their food catered from Joe T. Garcia. So it's, it's quite an event to go there. Um, we love that food. But if you want somewhere that maybe is not well known, but it's like a hole in the wall, really good food, there's a place called Nona Tata's. It's a small Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. Chef Donatella is the real deal. She's from Italy. She makes homemade ribbon pasta with all these different sauces that is just to die for. There's probably seating for 20 people inside and maybe 30 in the patio if you can stand being outside in the heat or the cold, whichever. But um, my husband and I kept them in business with curbside during COVID. <laughs> great Italian food. No natatas. All right. Those are some great recommendations, man. I wish we had talked like three weeks ago. I was speaking at the uh, Hilton in Fort Worth and uh, for a fraternity convention, and then I would have all these great food spots. So now I got to get booked again so I can come back and try Absolutely. some great food because <laughs> these recommendations sound fantastic right up my alley. I mean, I really mi miss that authentic Mexican food, the authentic Italian food. I miss all of that. I'm originally from New York City, so I had all of that stuff very plentiful. Uh, in sure. places like Little Italy in New York City mm -hmm. and, and other places. Uh, but here where I live in Nashville, Tennessee today, it's just not what they're strong at. It's not their strong <laughs> suit. You know, I'm looking I at barbecue. That. I mean, barbecue is great. Don't get me wrong. You have some great barbecue places too, but it's not Italian. You know, it's not Mexican. It's different. Um, so anyway, well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this great information, sharing everything uh, about your movie. It's called No Ordinary Love, one of the biggest summer movies in 2021. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. And thank you for being on the show, talking to our college students today. Thank you so much for having me. If anybody wants more on the film, you can go to noordinarylovemovie.com or follow us on social media, no, at no Ordinary Love Movie. Um, and also the Project Raise Awareness, there's a, a landing page, it's project-raiseawareness.com if they want to reach out about that. Fantastic. Go and check out the website. Go learn more about the movie. I think it's fantastic. Go and learn more about Project Raise Awareness. And uh, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. To all of our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation with Tracy, make sure that you like it. Make sure that you share it with other college students so that way they're aware that Tracy can come to your campus and show this movie and then have a conversation afterwards. Uh, I think this would be a great event, especially, uh, like she said, the month of February would be great. The month of April would be fantastic for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, and uh, what can I say? I mean, we appreciate you being here. We hope to see all of you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next time.